Okay. <clears throat> so let's um, let's recap very briefly where we are at. So once again, we're trying to solve this problem. <clears throat> I make it short just for space reasons. Okay, but it's actually long. There's a separation of scales. So in terms of length of the typical three momenta, scale R, distance, and lambda. And in the regime which we're interested, which is the PN regime, the relative velocities are small. <clears throat> and therefore, if this is compact, this is a split <clears throat> of order v square, and this is a split of order v. And what we did last time was I construct an effective theory that would describe the physics at the relevant scales, because ultimately, the two observables that we were interested to compute, or the observable that we wanted to compute is the phase of the wave. And we could get that if we get the change in the orbital frequency with time, because that's related to the frequency of the gravitational wave, which is what we observe. And to get this equation, remember, it came from two sources. We need the binding energy as a function of the frequency, and we need the flux as a function of the frequency. This we did just Newton. Here we actually computed the quadruple formula. And now we constructed the theory with which, with which uh, we will uh, go to higher orders. Right? And how did that work? Well, here we had full GR plus whatever goes inside. For example, for a neutron star, it was a equation state. And here we have a point particle action plus these coefficients. And here, coupled to the gravitational field. And here, we have two modes of the gravitational field. We have the modes which are responsible for the binding that I call potentials, and I'm going to denote this way. And I have the radiation modes, which I'm going to, sometimes you will see with a bar, but that bar is not any gauge choice. It's just that this is on-shell radiation, and these are the potentials. So this theory here is point particles coupled to these higher dimensional terms, and this guy is split into there are potential modes and there are radiation modes. <clears throat> now, these ones are the same that appear also here. So this is my infrared theory. This is my UV theory. So these guys are leading order is zero, but they will be sourced. When they propagate, they will be sourced by the uh, point particles, but also there will be corrections here that will also depend on the potentials, okay? And this, how this is gonna source gravitational waves will be one of the key elements, okay? Here we did the same. Here only the radiation mode survives. We also have a point particle action now, not for the, system, for the compact object, but for the binary. And here we have all these multiples. And what's going to happen is that these guys are going to enter in the multiples. Because they're going to become the UV, this scale R becomes the UV of the radiation theory. OK? And now let me write the action again. So this point particle action that we're going to use at every step to describe the system <clears throat> has a term that starts with the mass. And if it's a neutron star, includes also the binding energy. If it's the binary, it also includes the binding potential. OK? It's some coefficient that we need to match. And then here now, last time I only wrote the quadrupole. I'm going to write the whole thing now. Oh, let me just include the spin. So as we determine also the, the black holes of the neutron star could be spinning, 
but also the binary spinning. So here this could be either, it's the same theory every time, right? This could be either the spin of the black hole or the angular momentum of the binary. You still need to include this, okay? X is also minus, depends on convention. Those are the two line modes. And then we have all these multiples that I'm now going to write in general. It's a sum. And remember that we could remove all the traces, so we're going to use these electric and magnetic components of the, of the vial tensor. So this, this is just a convention, and I'm going to use a different notation. And the reason I use a different notation is just to make explicit that sometimes these objects, I, will be the quadruple of the body or the quadruple of the binary, okay? And then we use this notation that sometimes, I think I already used it, this is called L, okay? So the L minus two indices of the electric guy. And there's also a piece, uh, when, the, when we wrote the quadruple last time, I put a half, but now this is uh, just for convention, so the, the formula that we get resembles the formula that you will get in the traditional way. Like the quadruple formula, you put a two here to this. When we do the matching, as we'll see, we have to match these coefficients, right? That this will be the quadruple that you expect to be. And it's just what it means, okay? It's just a convention. Here there's another convention. And here there is the current part that couples to the magnetic field. You would have done the same if you have a dipole and higher mold quadruples, octopus, and so on. In electromagnetism, you would couple that guy to the derivatives of the electric field and magnetic field and the current and so on. Okay, this is my, my effective theory. So this is my effective theory of extended objects in long wavelength backgrounds, completely generic. Now, where is the field, you might ask? Well, the field is in here. D square, so we will impose reparameterization invariance, which means d tau, we open it up in terms of d square, d sigma, and sigma could be chosen to be any affine parameter. So here, the g is not, the, it's not in this, right, it's long. A long is compared to something. Well, the long fields compared to the scale R are both the potentials and the radiation. The long fields with respect to the scale uh, little r is the radiation. So when we hear <coughs> the field that we have here is both potentials, potentials and radiation modes, when we live up there, we only have the radiation. And that means <coughs> that, <coughs> sorry, when we have potentials here and we go to the radiation theory, the potential now gets promoted to the UV physics, okay? And now when we are in the scale of the radiation, those potential modes we integrate out and they become part of the coefficients. But the theory is the same, because in fact the theory tells you <coughs> Lorentz, local Lorentz invariance, diffeomorphism invariance, write everything that you can, get rid of terms that you can remove by field redefinitions, there you are. <coughs> okay, so I can summarize what I just said also saying that this guy can have different components, the same for J. It can have a background piece. I can have a response, as we saw. Now, the response depends on whether the object 
will be in the background of something else. And if we have two such bodies, then of course this guy will be in the background of the companion. The binary might not have any response if we don't put it in any background. Okay? But this is responsible for the tidal disruption. And as we saw, this so-called love number. And this is the UV physics of compact objects. This is, for example, measuring this, we will learn whether you have a neutron star, which has non-zero love number, or a black hole, which has zero love number. A leading order. Remember, I defined the love number as the zero frequency response in an external field. Now there are time-dependent coefficients, and those will encode also absorption. Those will be not zero. Black hole does, the black hole does absorb. Now, there is something really interesting here that I won't have time to discuss. If you take the susceptibility, right, and you define the, the, uh, the dipole in an external field. I don't want to use the words because I don't have that much space. So if you polarize the sphere in, in a static gravitational uh, uh, electromagnetic field, right, if you put some time dependence, there's some dissipation in the charges. So there's a real part of the response and there is an imaginary part. And then there's this kramer corner relationships, which has to do with analytic properties, that relates the imaginary part to the real part. So there's a response relationship between the absorption and this uh, susceptibility, the, the dipole, the induced dipole. Okay? If you do that for a black hole, you'll think that the absorption of the black hole will naturally lead to a, a, a static uh, remaining love number, like a susceptibility. But it's not there. So even though you can prove that the imaginary part of the susceptibility in electromagnetism has to be positive, because the real part is positive and you can do a contour integral, you cannot run the same argument here. So that really tells you something about what's happening, which is very different from what the intuition you have from electrodynamics. We actually tried to play with that a little bit, but uh, I, I don't have time to tell you more. <clears throat> so the background is the interesting part, because this, this is mostly for the compact object, but for the the background part, we get both for the compact and for the binary. Here, for example, the background part could contain the spin, for example, the spin induced quadrupole. If this guy, the, the, the guy is rotating, it's not in any, any external field, it will deform, and that deformation causes the spin. For the binary, there is such term as well. It, this is not enough. You have to include the S squared piece of the binary because the solution outside the binary is care. And the curve has a quadrupole, and that quadrupole is not here. The quadrupole will be here. And it's a background quadrupole. It's there in, 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 in the background of the binary without any perturbation. Okay? But also plus time dependent multiples. Dependent multiples. And this is, this is uh, uh, important for the binary. And this is important for the binary and the compact objects. This could be important for a compact object if it's, if it's uh, uh, if it has, for example, a supernova explosion, right? If you have some time-dependent moment or something that can produce gravitational waves. Okay. So this is this is remarkable. We can write a theory that essentially describes everything that is happening in there. It always takes the same form. And the only thing you need to be careful, okay, okay the, the theory is this plus GR, right? So this is, where should I write this? So here we also have, so these are the effective theories. And at each step, we also have to add <coughs> a St. Hilbert action of the long modes. And long, again, is either this or this, OK? So this einstein Hilbert <coughs> action with radiation and potential modes plus this describing each body is all you care about. And what, what you need now is to compute the change in, in time of the orbital frequency, which means you need to compute the binding energy, which is encoded in this coefficient for the effective zero of the binary, and the power, which is encoded in the time variation of these coefficients, as I'm going to do now. 
And then the only thing you need to know is how do you take dots? Because you're going to have derivatives of this guy, and this guy is going to be moments of the team you knew. And as we will see, that team you knew will also include the corrections that come from the potentials. Okay? And how do you take dots? It's because this M has the potential in it, and variations of the potential will give you equations of motion, and equations of motion tell you how to take the dots. Okay? So that's it. This is everything. So now you just have to shut up and calculate. Uh, not much philosophy, sorry. That's our philosophy. Um, so one of the things we need is the power, which will be necessary to get the dot. Right? Otherwise, the system would be purely conservative. There is no radiation. Um, are you all clear with the philosophy of how this is going to work? Yes. So now what we're going to do to compute the power is going to take this point particle action. I'm going to assume that there are no time-dependent moments uh, from here. I'm going to just concentrate on this part now. So it's only coupled to the radiation mode. This is the binary. If we open it up, He has two guys, two point particles, separated by a distance r, that we can also zoom and get, say, a black hole. This is r. OK? This is our zooming out in the factor theory and zooming in. If you start zooming in, then the binary is actually two bodies. Each point particle is actually a compact object. Okay. And this we're modeling with the theory with an M, which is not going to radiate, but the moments are. So we're going to see if we have some time-dependent moments, like a quadruple, what is the radiated power. And what, we, what we're writing here, what we're finding is that we can ex express that as a sum over all these multiples. So we're going to have a term. It's going to be the quadruple. You have a term. It's going to be the current. You're going to have a term, which is the octuple, and so on. The cool thing by writing this way, when I, I tell you how these i's are computed, is that there won't be interference, and there will be the square of this, the square of this, plus the square of this, and so on. And that's the key, right? To decompose those moments, to dress those eyes properly, such that when I compute the power, there is no interference between the terms. So actually, I am computing an amplitude to emit gravitons, or to emit gravitational fields, of a given helicity, this is the helicity, which is going to be plus and minus. Given a coupling in my action, which is this guy. I'm not going to do the current. The current you can do as an exercise. And you do that all the time with Feynman diagrams. The difference is uh, um, if you're doing the case of, uh, of Feynman diagrams, what you will have here is some propagation, some field that will have a T-minu component that will couple to gravity, right? So if you're writing the action of a field coupled to gravity, you have a T minu H minu coupling. And this will be some propagating field, like something coming in, something going out, deflecting, accelerating, and then emitting a gravity. Okay? We're not going to have those propagating degrees of freedom. We're going to have sources, time-dependent sources. They're external sources. So that's why I don't write a line here, even though historically you'll see in our papers in fact, we do have like the amplitude written, actually, even in my review, I think, like this, where I, J. And we did this not because it's a propagating degree of freedom, but because this is the binary shrunk to a point. OK, just to illustrate that. But it's really just source, source, source. And that's important. Okay?
Okay. And just in terms of uh, um, <coughs> units, so remember how this goes. This is 2 and Planck square times root G R. So when we open this up in H, and we span to second order. For convenience, also, we're used to like just the dimensional analysis. It's not necessary, it's just to get the propagators of the Green's functions without this M-Planck in them. I'm going to do something which I didn't do so far, which is divide by this M-Planck here. So I can get rid of this M-Planck here. OK? You're familiar with this, right? You just have to be a little careful when you go and compute the metric, because the metric is dimensionless. But this object that now we're using, this H, this new H, it has dimensions of mass. OK? So that means when I do that, I pick up a 1 over m Planck in the, in the amplitude. Okay. So as usual, we pick this 1 over m Planck. We have an L factorial from there. And then we have all the derivatives. We have all the k's of the, of the uh, minus 2 that will point. Right? I do it in Fourier space. This is uh, omega k with omega is k. So 1k squared. Ah, one other thing I didn't say. Good. Uh, there is some polarization here, tensor. Um, we're going to compute the physical radiation. So we can compute in the TT gauge. There, as usual, there are war identities. You can show that the only the physical modes, the, the unphysical modes, they don't radiate as long as the current is conserved. So this is a transverse traceless field. And this would appear here with the missing indices, right? I think it's an illuminating exercise to write this theory in electromagnetism. Okay? I don't know how many of you are going to take this exam. Uh, who, is, who needs this exam? Or uh, A exam? Do we know already? No. For, for me, three. Oh, cool. Awesome. So one of the problems will be to uh, do this for electromagnetism. Okay? It's much easier. There has no, no, no non-linearity, OK? But you can rederive everything that you're familiar with with this more modern approach, OK? And then you can throw your Jackson off. Now, we love Jackson. I actually learn a lot from Jackson. I actually learned to calculate from Jackson. I don't know about you, but then you face electromagnetism, and you say, shit, I need to learn some math. And then you learn effectively theory, and you say, OK, this is cool. All right, so this is our amplitude. And now we have to square it. And we're going to define the rate, which is going to be for a given k. We're going to have, well, what is the probability to emit over the entire time of the detector, meaning over the entire lifetime of the binary, which is long. There's a probability to meet these gravitons per unit of time. So we're going to compute the entire probability for a given k and uh, divide by the time. So we compute a rate. And there's a phase space that you're familiar with for massless particles. So phase space, so amplitude. Uh, I have no room. Uh, so time, which is infinity, or long, amplitude, 
square, so probability and phase space. If I have time, I will do this derivation also uh, in another way, which might be more, um, which you will see why this, this is the right answer. But you can also compute this as like probability of emitting gravitons, okay, over a long time, what is the rate? Now this comes, as you know, from the delta, right? So now the amplitude we have, we just need to square it. And then from the rate, we can compute the total energy loss into gravitational waves. From here, we're going to get the E dot integrated in this. So we're going to integrate the rate. But we're losing energy. So times the energy of the gravitons. And as uh, Jesse is insisting to me, the classical limit does not exist. The quantum is the real thing. And in some limit, you will get the classical answer. There is no each one. Yes? Imagine you simplicity test work about how you manage the amplitude. The amplitude or the usual way. I have a Feynman rule associated to an action. And just I compute the amplitude the usual way that you have a Feynman rule. And I was saying before that often what you do in a Feynman rule it's because you have a t mu nu couples to the h mu nu, and this t mu nu is something. For example, t mu phi, d nu phi, a scalar field. And then you have a phi, you have a phi, and you have an h. And then you have the Feynman rule here will be d, d p mu p nu coupled to this guy. And this will be the epsilon tensor. You, sorry? This is, this is my theory with the standard sources, the eyes are sources, right? And the field is the E and the long field. And the long field for me is the radiation. This is my radiation field. This is my external source. Yes, we're gonna take the classical limit of the quantum theory. Actually, those are uh, nice words, but it's really this calculation of a squaring, as you will see, the amplitude, it will be similar to a squaring this guy as we did with the pseudo tensor. Okay. So what I could have done instead of doing this is the following. Do, do, do this as an exercise. Actually, I might write it if I have time. Take this theory and compute the one-point function. Don't compute this amplitude, I just said this for you, which means square the amplitude. Just compute the one-point function. What is the metric field outside? Given the coupling with a t mu nu, right? You have a Green's function that comes from the einstein hilbert part. You can pick a gauge, invert that box equal t mu nu, so you have to just invert this, and this is a localized source, right? coming from that action. So you're going to get the m part, which is going to give you the 1 over r. And then there is a part from the i's. And you're going to get something that will be exactly what we got before. You're going to get ij double dot over r. Now with that h, go to your pseudo tensor again, square it, and compute the amplitude. And it's exactly the same as doing this. Okay. The other things that you might ask, which are interesting, is, is like this, this. We're doing linear theory here, right? So we just get this guy a quadratic order to get the propagator in the radiation theory, right? And then it just propagates box equals zero outside. Now what can happen, and I'm not going to have time to talk about that. Uh, what happens if now I take the mass multiple? And I have a correction, and I do it this way because the mass doesn't radiate, but it does source a static field. So what happens when the radiation interacts with the mass monopole? This has a name, and it's called tail effect. 
And it does change ra the radiation. Not only changes the radiation, introduces uh, yeah, many things. Introducing soft factors and infrared divergence that you need to deal with because they basically long-term behavior. This guy interacts with a potential with one over R, so it, lasts, uh, it goes everywhere. So as, yeah, at, at, it follows you to infinity. So this is very interesting, but it's also very interesting because this effect also enters in the radiation reaction. And therefore, um, it affects the dynamics. And it turns out that at some order, it might affect the dynamic in a way that looks like a conservative term. So it might even affect the binding energy. And this is very similar to what I was telling you before. Something like this would be similar to the lamp shift. There will be a tail effect as a lamp shift in the binding energy. So then you might ask how, those, how that theory has all the nonlinearities of GR and so on. But at this, at this level, we're doing the same as an electromagnetism. So you can do this as an exercise. You start with P, OK? But you can compute also what the power radiation is and derive here the dipole formula instead of the quadruple formula. OK. So now, um, now the catch when we, when we square that amplitude will be what to do with that epsilon. And what we need is this, this property that if you sum, um, we're going to have to use the total radiated power. So we're going to sum. So here we have to sum our helicities. And then when we have this guy, and we sum our helicities, this becomes a very long but no well-known expression that I'm not going to copy because it's too long. But essentially, it starts with delta IK, delta um, JL plus, and all the symmetrizations. Then there's a piece that goes like 1 over K squared. K, K, KL delta IJ and da, da, da. And then eventually, it's a 1 over k to the 4, k i, k j, k k, k i. It's not different than what we do to get the propagators with, with uh, the photons, right? And now, then, we get the e dot. Now what's going to happen is uh, um, we're going to have many of these integrals that look similar to the ones that we did before with the, with the, um, uh, the projection, the gamma, because these are like ni's, right, pointing in a direction. And this guy is going to have a solid angle piece as well, right? So it'll be <coughs> k squared d energy d solid angle, and that d solid angle integral would be of these n's. And that will pick up a factor. Um, OK, let's see if I remember this. So if you have an integral of solid angle of this ends, which we will have here, many uh, twos and fours and so on, this is 0 if it's odd. And if it's even, it goes like uh, 1 over L plus 1, or the total L. Let's go this way, L plus 1. And it's delta I1, I2. Oh, it, it, you have more, right? L minus 1, IL, and all the symmetrization. So it's a bunch of deltas. So. Um, for the two is one third delta ij, and then you have delta delta, and then all the symmetrizations if you have n, 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 as we did last time. And remember, in the other case, it was uh, 1 over 15, but there were, like, here there was a 12, so here there will be, with l equal uh, 4, 4 of these guys will be 1 over 5, because it was 4 times 3, so the 3 cancels the 15 that we had before. Is that too quick? Remember, in the, in the previous one, we had an A and a J and K and L. And I wrote 1 over 15 times 12, if you go back to your notes. But now, I write it as 1 over 5, but this is 4 times 3, so the 3 kills that guy. And this 4 that survives comes from all the symmetrizations of the 4 terms. Okay? You have to do this. This is uh, 
checking that uh, this works. I'm telling you, you have to do it. OK, good. So now the answer at the end, and I'm using the G Newton comes out because of this n plan, one over n plan square. So you have a square of this, one over n plan square gives you the G Newton. So n plan square, one over 32 pi G Newton. Where pi times this t that we put in there, and you see why it's there. It's an integral. OK. And this is the absolute value that you can, uh, of k that comes out from that integral. I'm just calling it omega now. But it's, it's really this. It's just the d of k. And there was a l here. There are L's of these guys, but then when you symmetrize it, you just get the, the K to some power. The angular dependence will give you all the deltas, and we contract case with case. Then it's important that every time you hit the I, which no, nobody told me, I'm missing here. Every time you hit the I, and the i is uh, trace free, that piece goes away. OK? So when you do that angular integral, some of those are going to contract with the i, and the traces are going to be 0. And then when you contract with the k, you get k to some power. So at the end, you get the absolute value of k to some power. And that power is 2l plus 2. It's 2l, as it is there, because it's kl squared. And the two extra two comes from the D3K. There's a 2K here, but I multiply by K for the energy. OK? So this K kills this K. The extra K squared goes here. The 2L is this L. OK? And then we get this guy, square, trace free. That the guys are trace free is by construction. It couples to something which is traceless. So the trace is not there. Okay. And this was also related to uh, um, the theory that we have, a ultimately gauge invariance, that allows us to vary the theory and the ball to get rid of all the traces. Okay. Which is ultimately saying that this guy has just two polarizations. Right? <clears throat> Einstein was not aware of all this thinking at the time. So he had something here that could have emitted, even if it was uh, a trace, pure trace. Right? He corrected that later. And if I copy this right, the answer looks like this. And this just comes from the angular integrals and summing all the deltas. And this just means you go down by 2 instead of one, like the factor n. And then something similar with j. I'm not going to write. Da, da, da. Again, do it as an exercise. It's a little different because you need the b. But um, I, you have your exam to do. OK, so let's, let, now we have this t here. So what does it mean? But what we see what's happening here, right? If we put here this 2 pi, we can do from minus infinity to infinity. And this here is an integral that if I go to time, it just means sufficient derivatives of this guy integrated between minus infinity and plus infinity in time and divided by the total time. So this will give me something like this, that I'm going to replace by the average of that quantity in time. OK? So that's why this guy is doing here. He cancels all the time because you, you are emitting over the, the entire time. 
because that's what we can compute as an amplitude from minus infinity to plus infinity. But we can compute, the, uh, we can interpret this as the average uh, emission rate. That actually we can do orbit by orbit, right? So we can actually have that integral over a period. Now, how does it look for the for the quadrupole? Well, for the quadrupole, we have two, so we have a three here times four. Voila, that was our, our twelve. Then two times two, and this is uh, two, five, uh, times three. So four, four, three, three, one fifth. G Newton over five. And then uh, uh, three derivatives on each. Six in total, right? And that's your quadruple formula. I will derive this by the end of these lectures, if I have time, um, three different ways, right? Almost four, if you think about it. So first, we computed the traditional way. We solve for the, uh, for the metric far away. And then from the metric, we use the pseudo tensor to compute the, uh, the energy carried away by the waves. Now we have this effective theory. And we can compute also the one point function. Solve for the metric, plug it in the pseudo tensor, you get this. Or compute the rate as an amplitude in the projection on the physical states is, is there and that you get uh, uh, the uh, total radiated energy. And there's one more way to get exactly the same thing. And I'll do it after I tell you who that M is, which will be trying to get this part, which I haven't told you anything about yet. So I will show you, when we try to get that M to compute this, that there is one way in which this one comes out also for free, almost for free. So now we know in our theory how to compute the power. We know the theory, we know how to compute the power. I still haven't told you how to do the M, hopefully. I'll have time to tell you how to do that. Um, now I have to tell you who this I is, who R. How do I match the I? Because so far so good, but who the heck are these I's, okay? This is generic, any theory we have this, very good. So who is this I? Uh, I'm gonna use this for. So now we do the matching. Although this is, this is indeed part of the matching, it's still very generic. It doesn't necessarily mean that we will apply this to the binary. It could apply to any, any theory. We're going to now open it up. And we're going to have, let's do Tx. my coupling. So I'm gonna open it up, means this was a point-like object. Now I'm gonna look at the actual energy density in the system in, in some given region, V, right? So my effective theory treats as a point. Now I zoom, this is in time, right? I zoom in and I have some T minu in space now, which is not localized, it's everywhere, okay? From this theory, I integrate out the short distance modes of the T and I got, I got that theory, so now I'm gonna do the matching. Now there's a catch here, which is who is this T? So I'm gonna call it differently, so we don't get confused with um, the matter T. This T is whatever couples to my long distance field, okay? 
And because we, we will do it in a, when we integrate out the field to compute the effective theory, we'll do it in a way that respects the symmetries. So we're going to use what is called the background field method. So we're going to use background gauge fixing. So we know that this long distance field will respect the symmetries. So we have a conserved current. So this is the conserved current. So it's not the matter field that is covariantly conserved. It's not conserved in the usual way. So this guy includes short gravitational modes. And by short, it depends on which theory we're at. What is short and what is long will depend on where we are in the diagram, which I think I erased, unfortunately. Um, Meaning if we are in the radiation theory, like us, now, and this has some multiple, and we matching this into that theory, this guy includes here all the potential modes, all the gravitational modes that are shorter. So let me make that more explicit. which I haven't done that, uh, yet because uh, we've been dealing mostly with the radiation, but now we're going to start going towards computing that M. Let's now be more specific. What does the short modes are? Who, who these guys are? Sorry. Um, Jimmy, no? So we're matching, we're matching between the radiation theory of, of uh, pawn-like binary with radiation modes in the theory of two point-like objects, we already match into this point-like theory with the tidal numbers and so on and so forth. Let's ignore that for now. We are matching now into a theory that has all the, the matter T mu localized somewhere in some world line. We already integrated out all the short modes of the compact object, so now the T mu matter is localized. Okay? But it still is interactive with some degrees of freedom of the gravitational field, which are short and, as well, the long ones. Both. Both are in this theory. Now we're going to get rid of this one. Okay? And who's that one? Oh, this vibrates too much. So this is what we've been doing, the splitting H. This implant here is not relevant. It will be relevant because uh, when we compute the Green's function, so the propagators, we don't want this implant in the action. Um, it's just for convenience. So now this H mu nu is split into these guys, which are the potential modes, and these guys. Now I'm going to put a bar just for distinguishing from this guy, which are the radiation modes. These guys are on shell. I'm ignoring now that this tail effects that I told you about. So let's just write um, these guys propagate on shell and they are physical, physical on shell. These guys, I'm, I'm not going to call them unphysical even though uh, you're tempted, but they're certainly off shell. And they are of shell in the sense that the spatial, the spatial variation of this field is of the order of one over r, whereas the time variation is much longer. Things here change in time on the scale v over r. There's no way around it. But in space, that's why these coefficients still depend on time, and those derivatives are spatial derivatives not time derivatives, okay? Which was different from before when we integrated out these guys. Here, space and time is short, and we could just write a fully different variant theory, where the tidal love number, for example, could be just a coefficient that does not depend on time without absorption, right? And we can just write down the operator like this. This is a space-time, and this is just a number. This is not what we did there. 
okay? Because in time, the variation of the potential is the same as the, as the radiation. There is no decoupling there. <clears throat> and for those of you who uh, have seen how this also applies to the study of large structures, the same happens there. Everything changes on a Hubble time. Even though there is the nonlinearities, they are reduced to maybe like one or ten megaparsec. Right. So these are my potential modes. And these are my own shell physical modes. Now, there is a, um, if you have never seen this method of regions, then uh, I can do justice in uh, five, ten minutes. Um, but what this really means, I will see, it will be very motivated by when we compute the, the binding energy. What's going to happen is that the contributions to the binding energy will come from regions. There will be an integral. That integral has to do with the nonlinearities of GR. It won't be just the one over. That, that integral, in principle, is the full integral. Because how do we know what contributes to that integral? We have modes which are radiation and potential, both. So in principle, we have to include everything. But when you look at that integral, you realize that there are regions of the integral that contribute the most. That actually, what is the main contribution to the, to the, to the integral that comes from modes that obey this scaling? Right? And this would be obvious, for example, um, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I want to motivate why those guys are there, or why this is the scaling of the potential. Because you're not used to taking one field and say, I'm going to integrate one piece of the field. So what does that mean? So let's motivate a little bit those guys, because this will help us also to understand when we compute the binding energy, those are the guys that will produce the binding energy. There will be some, some contribution from this tail that I told you. There will be a region in which this scaling will not be the only thing that contributes. So you have to be very careful. Okay? But for the majority, it will come from this part. And let's just, uh, just motivate them. So what is the actual um, Green's function? So ignore this for, for, for a minute. You have to put some boundary conditions. If you do retard it, you put this guy here. And we have some localized sources. That's what we're going to have, these localized sources. So this will have a K0, T minus T1, because there will be a wall line for this guy and a wall line for the other guy. So the field will be produced. Ignore this T, this T and X2 for now. The field will be produced by the Green's function times the localized source, which in momentum space is an e exponential. Now we truncate that with the other guy, because at leading order the energy will be m times phi, right? And phi will come from the zero zero component. So that means that now I'm going to have something like m a zero zero m one a zero zero m two. These sources, and this is m times the potential which comes from the Green's function on m two. Okay? This just means compute the h. This will be compute the h that is sourced by one of the guys and multiplied by the t, zero, zero of the other guy, which is also localized, and it puts this guy here. We'll see how that comes out, because we will use those guys to actually compute this to all orders. But just naively, if you don't understand where this comes from, it's very easy to say, OK, a leading order, basic, two sources interacting with a green function linear, which is box. What is the potential? And if these guys are static, this is dt1, dt2. If those two guys are static, they don't move, say. So the dt kills the k0. So then, and then there is an integral here in d4k, right? So this dt kills the k0, and then you get a delta of k0, 1 over k squared. And then you Fourier transform, and then you get the 1 over r. But it, it's static. It kills the k0 component. Now imagine that you're moving a little slow. It cannot be too far from this. This case zero has to still be subleading. All of a sudden, you're not going to be the mode responsible for this binding. It's not all of a sudden become the radiation mode. You will be a small correction to this, so there will be velocity effects. 
1 plus v squared at lambda. So that's what motivates this uh, potential mode. Because in, in general, this is a D4K. You have to integrate the full Green's function. But you will see that if you're moving very slowly, the region that contributes to the potential, to the potential, not to the, there will be radiation as well, will be when the K-zeros are much smaller than K. Because the static case is actually zero. Okay? But now the key is that those guys also coupled to the radiation because the gravity is nonlinear, so they also enter here. If you expand the Einstein action, you're going to get terms. This term will also come from something that is H, 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 potential, potential radiation. And this has been integrated out. And this will contribute to this guy. Now, let's get a little fancier. How do you construct an effective action? We integrate, which is only a function of the light fields. We integrate the heavy fields. In the full theory, we heavy and uh, light. Now, this could be modes of the same field. And in fact, if you remember uh, what Wilson did, that's pretty much shells of momentum that you integrate now. Now you have to be careful. So when you do that, you match into the effective theory, and that effective theory is the one that we want to construct. But you have to be careful with symmetries. If this guy is transformed non-trivially, is that what we're going to do is construct a theory of only the radiation modes, and we're going to get rid of the potential modes. So these are potentials, and these are radiation. And we already have here integrated out the short distance of the compact objects. So we have x1 and x2, center of mass of each compact object, plus the spin. Right? Forget the spin. So we're going to get rid of this guy. And this theory, we have some coupling like this. From the potentials. Contributions from these guys to this guy. That we're matching. We're matching this theory into that theory. This one, then we, we look far away, and then we, this matches into my eyes, and I will tell you how this one goes into that in a second. So eventually, what, it, what we want to construct is this theory. But let's just first uh, stop here for a second, because we see here we're going to have couplings like H, H, this, that we integrate out and they will dress my T mu. Now you have to be careful because in gravity we have a gauge fixing term. And to make it such that it's a conserved current, better be that you respect this invariant. So this gauge fixing, which is often uh, done with this harmonic gauge, in which uh, this thing um, uh, how is the harmonic gauge exactly? I now go this about this. So. This is uh, mu, blah, 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 blah. okay, here, alpha mu minus the alpha h mu. So usually it is square, right? Usually you do this uh, uh, harmonic gauge condition, you square it like the same as you would do with the uh, electromagnetism, like you have more indices. Because this is what gives you the propagator in the so-called the donder gauge and so on. I don't know if I have time to do it properly, but there's always like in, in, in QED, when you put the D mu, you put the square, right? This is the same, just in gravity, it's a little more complicated. Now what happens here is that this derivative, this partial derivative, I'm gonna make it covariant with respect to H. So we respect the symmetries, sorry, with respect to H, and this is the potential that I'm integrating over. So we respect the symmetries with respect to the radiation, such that now this guy is conserved. That's the only catch. The only catch is you have to be a little careful when you integrate out the sphere. And that's why you use the background field. All that to justify that we have these modes, 
and that we construct a team in U that has this modes in and it's also conserved and it will be in our theory. And now, after all that, I'm going to tell you how we go from here to there. So this you should be semi-familiar with, meaning if I want to um, have the gravitational field and I want to do the path inter with the gravitational fields, you have to fix the gauge, which is the same as what we did before with the TT uh, gauge, the same way we do with the Lorentz gauge in electrodynamics. In gravity, it looks a little different. It has this combination. And what we do in this effective theory, and we integrate out the modes, we have to be careful with different variants. So we do this background field, so we preserve the symmetries that gives us a conserved current that we know we need. Remember, we use these moment relations to go from the integral of Tij to two derivatives of the T0,0. And that was crucial of the Qij. That was crucial to be able to go from here to there and match to a theory which is different by, by construction. OK? So that's just a technicality. But hopefully, we motivate who these guys are, because those are the binding forces. If you're an effective field theorist and you've seen all these method of regions and so on, you could just start there. You can say, oh, obviously, I have two modes. I have the binding mode and I have the radiation mode. In fact, in, in theories like uh, in QCD, you have many modes. We have Glover modes, we have potential modes, you have soft modes, ultra soft modes, and so on, soft, collinear. We didn't invent that. Walter and I did not invent that either, right? This is the stupidest thing you can do, right? Just two modes, binding and radiating. But there is a long history behind. Okay. All right, so now that we know there is this current, this current is conserved, how do we match this into that? Well, we do the multiple expansion. As we were saying, this field varies on a scale much longer than this guy now. So we can multiple expand it, and we're going to uh, we can always, now that it's written in this way, and we're going to match in that theory, we can match on shell. We can match in any way we want. We can match on shell by going to the TT gauge. And this is our big tensor. So this is what we're going to look in both theories. I'm going to put TT over there, and I'm going to put TT over here. I have an integral in time as well that I'm going to factor out. And I'm going to multiple expand this guy. Multiple. Uh, so Taylor. Meaning I take the binary and I shrink it to a point. And I choose a point, for example, the center of mass of the binary. And I expand Hij T of x. And I'm going to put this at zero just for convenience. And my origin is going to be there. So I don't have to put x minus x center of mass everywhere. So it will be Hij T plus derivatives. Uh, let's call it different. Uh, L K Hij T zero x k blah, blah, blah. x measure with respect to the center of mass, right? So let's just write one x minus center of mass, okay? And let's just plug this in here. This is exactly the same in coordinate space of what we did in momentum space for this guy. When we do that, we get already get one term, which is the first term, which looks like integral dt hij t0. So it factors out of the integral tij tx d3x. That's the first term. You will start to see exactly the same we had before. <coughs> now at the level of the action, and now as a matching between uh, the theory with potentials and radiation modes and the theory without the potentials. Now we already know who this guy is, right? We already show that this is um, two derivatives 
of the integral of t0, zero, zero, xi, xj. I'm not going to call it q yet, OK? And now, uh, OK, just to be consistent, there was an m plan here, and there was a minus a half. And now I have a dt here. So I'm going to take this and integrate by parts. So I'm going to have a half integral dt of minus d0 square over 2 hij. This 2 went over here, integral of uh, um, uh, d3x, t0, 0, 0, xi, xj. And now this is my E. In the TT gauge, remember that it was just two derivatives of the, of the HIJ component. So this, in the TT gauge that we're using too much, this is the electric field. And then voila, we wrote this now as one half integral of DT of the electric field, evaluated on the point, which is that theory evaluated on a point, times an integral of some object. When we compare the two theories, we identify this guy, I should make it this way, just remember, as our IIJ. So leading order in the multiple expansion, the matching is telling us that the first coefficient in the multiple expansion of my effective theory of a point-like object is the moment of T0, the second moment of T0 also known as the quadruple. So I call it I just to make sure that we don't know a priori what it is, but we know that we are getting this guy. Right, and the half, the half it was just this convention such that you get the quadruple, okay? But it, you could use whatever you want. But better be because we, when we prove here that this was g over phi, better be the same, otherwise we will not get the same answer. Right? So now the question that you might ask is, um, what about the next guys? Well, higher derivatives will dress, this will dress the current, for example. So do that as an exercise. How does this guy will go in the current? And which moment is j? OK. But then you keep on going. And now it, this is the catch. This is the tricky part or somewhat tricky, you end up with a guy, for example, in which you have two derivatives, sorry, k, l of hij, integral. This is all evaluated at zero, right? So it's always pulling out. We're doing the shrinking. tij, xk, xl, d3x. And now the problem that I was mentioning, I think, in the second lecture. What does this mean in terms of that decomposition? This is a contribution to what? To the quadruple? To the octuple? Remember, if I write it this way, then everyone squares beautifully. And the catch now is to find out how much of this looks like the quadruple. In other words, this, which is a 2 times 2, it has an octopole of 16, it has a 3, and it has a 2. It has traces that we don't care. So this is TT. It has traces that we don't care. It has a lot of traces that we can just throw out. We also match in on shell, which means HIJ of TT is 0, which means tan derivatives are the same as special derivatives. So when we have traces that get this guy uh, kills, when we got onshore conditions, we also go. But we have a two here that will go into the quadruple. Which means just start taking traces out. 
And when you set some traces out, you trace over these indices, and you trace by D0, and the D0 becomes E. And whatever you get in there is your contribution to the quadruple. So just reduce this into irreducible representations. There is something there that transforms as a two. That's the only thing. And this is your group theory. This one done by Andy to all orders, Andy Ross, in a paper that is, uh, uh, I think it's called multiple expansion at the level of the action, because this is exactly what he's trying to do. And, and if I could use the computer, I will show you the table of how each moment depends on the moments of t in a very complicated manner, but it's very simple to do your Jan tableaus, right? Things that you did at some point, or you will do at some point in your quantum mechanics. Uh, did I already go through this? So let me just tell you how it looks like, because it will take me a while to derive it. Um, and you can also use um, moment relations, like the one that we use here, to simplify the answer. The answer is very simple. You will have traces out. You just take all the traces out. And then you trace here, and you get E. This one is easy. This one you can use by eye, almost. And then you use the moment relations to factor out all the terms that don't look like X I, X I, xj as we did here. So if you do that and you factor out the xi xj, what you find is this guy is equal to the integral of t0, 0, 0 that we already have. There is an integral of a trace, and this combination will appear a lot. And then uh, minus 4 third t c y dot, and the dots appear because of these moment relations, OK? It's the only reason, because it's just taking the traces down. j plus 11 over 42 t0, 0, double dot, um, x squared, everything. And we did this such that we can factor out this piece, trace free. In, in reality, the terms that we get are, are um, traces. So t, k, k, x, i, x, j is good. But then you get t, i, j, the square, because you're going to have the trace here that will give you the d0. But that you can trace by derivatives. OK? So this means this is, a, this is the next two leading order in multiple expansion. in k dot x, or derivative times x, which is the same, which is r over lambda, which is done by v. But each one of these guys, I haven't told you yet who they are. I still need to match for these t's. They will start, indeed, with the mass, as you know, with the point particle contribution. But there are, bind there are uh, binding potentials that will also contribute to t that I need to match. But what's going to happen is very clear, is that this is leading order in the PN expansion, in PN. And this goes clearly as V squared in PN, because it's V squared is, is, if you remember, the, the, there's a matter contribution here. There's a matter contribution mu nu, or ij, that goes like V i V j. So clearly, this guy goes like V squared. So even though these two enter now up to uh, next to leading order in the multiple expansion, this was leading order in, PI, in PM, but also we'll get corrections because the t0, 0 will also have a gamma, a dt over t. So this is also going to have a v squared. So this guy will have a 1 plus v squared. This will also have a v squared and higher orders. And this starts with v and a derivative. So it's also square, and this also. So each one of these guys, you have to PN expand. And then you have to go to the next order in the multiple expansion, do your group theory. So there are more moments. And each one of them will have some PN order. So if you were trying to do this brute force, you'll be dead. But since we split it very neatly, we know who the theory is. We know how to compute the radiation. We know how those moments enter in each one of my Wilson coefficients. All I have to do now is tell you who these T are. And we know from the matter part, it's very easy because we already construct a point particle action. That gives me at least a mass 
times the delta function with the two velocities. That's the leading order here. And then there is a spin contribution. The only catch will be how the potentials dress these guys. And this will be the, what we need to compute the, the radiation, including also the nonlinearities. Okay? So we're almost at the end of the, of the game. What we need now is uh, tell you who this T is. And in telling you who this T is, I'm also going to tell you who the M is, because we're going to need the T's to compute the fluxes and the M to compute the binding energy and the quasi motion. Yes? Oh, this is just some, sorry. Okay. I shouldn't call it I, maybe yet. Sorry. This you can do without knowing which, which theory you're talking about. This you can do in electromagnetism as well with J. Instead of being uh, TH, it will be JA. And the same story. You can multiple expand, you can reduce, and so on. This is just a little more complicated because we have more indices. Okay, I don't want to erase that, so let me erase here. I just noticed that I don't have that much time, right? unfortunately. Uh, which means I'm going to start speeding up, which is not good. <laughs> um, remember what is this good for? This, these lectures are good for, so then you go and read my review report, and then you, ah, okay. Um, All right, now we have to do, um, we have to do the matching. Um, okay, let me, let me uh, what is the most efficient way? Without assuming that you know what I'm talking about, right? Because I already told you a little bit of how this is gonna work. We have an effective theory that only involves the radiation modes that we constructed by integrating out the potentials from a theory that has both the potentials and the radiation modes and the, the point particle one plus point particle two. So this will be bulk, if you want, let's, okay, let's do it this way. This is uh, Einstein Hilbert, and each one of these also depend on this and each body, the central mass of each body. Not the binary, but each body, okay? And this one depends on the central mass of the binary. And only the radiation field. Now, to compute the T, we do this. this uh, um, we know the gauge fixing with respect to. So instead of taking the, this gauge fixing term, instead of taking the derivative, the normal space, flat space derivative, we take it with respect to the. Um, the radiation field, the background field, so the radiation is a background for the theory of potentials. But notice that that piece, that M there, has a contribution from, from zero, zero, from, from the uh, flat space background. So here, there is clearly a contribution which is just MDT, okay? So we can just match that one. What does that mean, vacuum, no radiation? We will be missing the tail features, but let's ignore the tail for now. So let's just, we can do this in the back, in the back, in vacuum, so we're gonna set the radiation to zero. So we can set the radiation to zero and you don't complicate my, my life. So this becomes just D. So now notice what we're doing is something you have done many times in field theory already. You're computing a partition function by integrating out your field, in this case H, with your field coupled to some external source. And this external source is the point particles. So this looks like H Operator, or so if you go quadratic in Einstein, 
let's call it different. D, some, some operator that is, depends quadratically on derivatives. This would be my bulk action. Plus the gate fixing term that would allow me to invert this guy. Plus something that a linear order, the capping uh, here is space time, but if I call it J, it's like my J phi term, okay? Which is my T mu nu H mu nu term. But also, there are non-linearities here because the metric here, if you want that uh, term that also applies to each body individually, has a square root. And then that means that uh, you expand that, the 1 plus h, and you get h, h square, and blah, blah, blah. If you're, Feynman, if you're doing Feynman here, it means that there is a source that it couples to the field, but there is also a term that has two legs from the source. From, but there is also, from here, plus order hn bigger than 2, which means that the field itself also couples. So my theory is a theory of nonlinear gravitons, which are potential, which the scaling of the propagator is what we have over there, coupled to a source, not only linearly, but also a nonlinear. Because my action has this square root over there that gives me all these extra it gives me all these extra terms. And here we have all these nonlinearities. Right? So if you've seen field theory, it just means use my rules that Feynman gave you to do this integral. Because this is what we're doing. We just don't do any loops. Don't do don't run G Newton, okay? No need to. I mean you you, you can if you want, but this effect is super small. But this is what it means. We diagrammatically computing this guy, right? It means for a linear order. What does it mean? It means this plus this plus da 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 da. Now, beautifully, this exponentiates, which is our effective action, which is just a linear order, just this guy. And this is what I wrote. Uh, a few minutes ago, was the leading order potential is just the Wilson loop. That I show you, if those two guys are static, it just goes into one over R. Now, it's not quite, right? This is an action. So it's an integral of a potential in time. So actually, there was a dt that I didn't tell you. There were two dt's. It was dt1 and dt2. One of the dt's killed the k0. The other dt survives because what we get is an action, and then we read off the potential. So from here, we read off, if this is an action, we read off a potential. Forget about the kinetic time. The kinetic time, you span that guy and goes for the right. Okay? So that's the catch. That's how we do it. We solve for the potential modes, which means now all the connected diagrams, so the nonlinearities will have terms like this, and terms like this, right? But what is the power counting? Well, the power counting is obviously here in G Newton. This increases with G. And as, as we determine, GM over R, which will be the dimensionless parameter, will go like this square. And each one of these guys will give you extra derivatives. So every time you get a new G, you get a new mass. So you get a GM. And you get an extra derivative, you get a V square. You can do this very formally with the power counting rules, but it's obvious that each one you have a nonlinearity, it will cost you v squared. So it will be an extra post-Newtonian correction. Okay? Now, in principle, this is the full propagator, but we already determined if it's a static, the k0 goes away. So the scaling of the potentials essentially is telling us that this propagator, which in principle, when you use the gate fixing term, say this uh, 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 harmonic condition, you get something like this. And there is an I epsilon prescription to be done, but since K0 is going to be very small compared to K, who cares about the epsilon? These guys are off shell. I epsilon only matters when you go on shell. Um, and there is some 
object up here that replaces the Jimmy new that you know in QED. This object is a little more complicated. It just means how do you invert this operator with that guy. And this in, in what is called the donder gauge, uh, mu alpha, uh, nu beta plus mu beta, uh, nu alpha minus. It's just more indices, but it's the same as the, uh, actually, this is another very interesting thing, right? It doesn't look like this, which would be awesome because it will double copy. It will mean that two copies of the, of the ENM case will give you gravity. Now, this is a very interesting and active uh, area of research. I chose a gauge here. So this gauge geology is kind of misleading because there is some way to double copy one into the other that is hidden by this. So in some sense, like maybe this one was better. Okay, but historically, this is what is called the under gauge that um, has been used because it simplifies a lot of the calculations as well. Um, so there is something that contracts the sources, and that's just the, the spin tensor. Here we already said that what's going to happen, since these are localized sources in momentum space, they just like this. And this full four dimension. So what's going to happen is that when I integrate this and they say there is a, an integral in time, we're going to choose the parameter to be time. So this is dt1 and dt2. That's just the integral in dt, the sigma, OK? And this is just a delta function. I'm not doing any mysterious. This is just a delta function because it's localized. And I'm looking at the zero component, which is just m. This one has an m1. This one has an m2. m delta, period. OK? And we already determined that if it's static, then the k0 is not there. So what this is telling us, we're going to de decompose this into this potential and radiation mode. And the radiation mode is so much longer that it will look like we integrated out the binary, we made it a point, and it's talking to this radiation field. And here comes the other way to derive the power. Because this guy is long, and it can go on shell, now the boundary condition matters. And if I'm, if I'm smart as Feynman, I will not use the retarded boundary conditions. I will use this I epsilon prescription, which, by the way, comes from the path integral by weak rotation. And now I look at the imaginary part of this diagram, which gives me the cut. And lo and behold, that cut will be the amplitude square. So do as an exercise the imaginary part of this diagram, and you realize when you multiple expand, you bring down x, k, x, 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 x. And then you're going to end up with k to the 6, xi, xj, xi, xj, which is the quadruple. So you will recover what we did before. <laughs> And if you do this diagram in that theory, and you compute the cut, the imaginary part, by integrating the radiation field in that theory, you immediately get the power as well. Which is to say something which is kind of obvious, is that the imaginary part of this guy is related to the decay width. Why? Because if you put imaginary, if you think about this as a Hamiltonian times time, then if you put imaginary, you get e to the minus gamma t. So by looking at the imaginary parts of these diagrams and the cuts, you can also get the power. Do that as an exercise. It's also in the, in the papers. Um, so that, but that's very compact. It's very nice. If you integrate out everything, potentials and radiations, the potentials will give you real parts of these guys. The radiation will give you imaginary parts. So if you are strong enough to give me this function, just as a function of the sources, you integrate out potentials and radiations, the real part will give you the potential, and the imaginary part will give you the flux. Now, we don't do it that way because we complicate our lives. We first match into that theory, we compute those eyes, and we already show you what the radiation looks like. So I don't have to reconstruct all this x, x, x as the multiples, OK? But it's all in this path integral, as it should be. But we now with different boundary conditions. You have to use the Feynman boundary conditions to get this to work because of the optical theorem. Because otherwise, you don't get, when you take imaginary part, you don't get the delta of k squared, which is what you get when you do it in this guy. The imaginary part picks the guys on shell, and that's when you get the radiation of the phase space part that in the other case was the d3k over 2k. It will come here from the imaginary part that will pick the delta. Okay. 
but that we don't have to do because we already proved how the radiation comes. So now we're just doing the potential. So we just care about real part. And real parts come from modes where k0 is much, much less than k. So how do we deal with that? Well, we introduce the, the k0 as a perturbation, which means k0 much, much less than k. So this propagator, we're going to span in k0. And then we have k squared, 1 plus k0 squared over k squared plus da 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 da. And we're going to treat this as a perturbation the same way that sometimes we treat the mass as an insertion, which means that if the propagator of a static field we represent it this way, the first insertion of this guy is like a mass. This is, and this costs me v square. Now, why does this cost you a v square? Let's go back to the calculation that we did a second ago. So a second ago, we computed the first diagram. So I'm going to do this guy. So these are delta functions. These are the exponentials. Let's, let's show again what we get. So this was the full thing. And we had the exponentials, x1 minus x2, t1 minus t2. This is nothing, huh? This is just getting m1 and 2. This is just going to my theory for the point particles, getting this coupling. And this is delta 3 somewhere times the mass. And I just put it here. When I integrate this out in the, in the partition function, as I just show you, this guy is just this diagram. In fact, the theory, if the theory is linear, this is exact. It's a Gaussian that you can even integrate. As you know well, if you're integrating in d phi, and you had e to the i phi box phi plus j phi, this integral you can do exactly. And you get j, the propagator, j, a half. Because the Gaussian. You just have to complete the squares. You all have seen this. Right? Okay. And what happened now is because there is a dt, that's crucial. dt1, dt2, because that integral there is in dt, is that there is no time dependence, the dt gives me the kill. But if there is time dependence, then what happens? Now, now it's different, t1 and t2. Now we cannot do this trick anymore. It's not a static, but we're going to expand. So what does this mean? This is the key of the method of regions. It means that if you understand what you're doing, which means when you run into divergences, better be careful, an expansion outside of the integral is the same as an expansion inside of the integral. That's highly non-trivial. And it's not been proven in general. It has been proven in many to high orders in perturbation theory when you actually have quantum mechanical corrections. It means that I know the answer will be done by V. I know that I can post Newtonian expand the full answer. But nobody told me that I can post Newtonian expand inside, in the K0, because I'm integrating over K0. But if I expand here, I will screw up the, the IR and the UV. This is certainly not a very smart thing to do, to introduce a correction, so 1 over K squared, to introduce a correction that gives me more Ks downstairs. Because what I'm going to do with this K0 is because I have the dt's, I'm going to trade it for time derivatives, and I'm going to integrate by parts. When I trade it for time derivatives and I integrate by parts, I bring down k dot v, and now is how the v's come out. So what do I get when I trade this this way? I get ki, kj, vi, vj over k to the 4. So you just need to do now this integral, and you know it's done by v squared. Again, k0 here, this, you put it here, the k0, I'm going to say, ah, it's derivative with respect to t1, t2 of this function. But I'm integrated with respect to t1 and t2, so I'm going to integrate by parts. This is going to bring down the kx1 and kx2. Actually, if you want, more, be more careful. This depends on t1, this depends on t2. And then, now it's gone. I can do the integral, and it gives me, again, the delta function. But this time, it gives me a delta function of t1 minus t2. Because the k0, t1 minus t2, when I integrate in k0, 
it puts t1 and t2. And therefore, now I get an integral only on t. And now those guys are put at the same t. Because once this guy disappear, and I integrate in k0, this is delta. So this basically puts the instant What I'm doing is the retardation. I'm treating it as an instantaneous correction. So I'm basically integrating or expanding in time in derivatives. In time derivatives, I make it look like a local interaction because a little bit of retardation. And it costs me b. So it gives me a correction that's going to be down by v squared. So it's going to be 1 over r or where q v dot r squared. And therefore, this diagram will correct <coughs> or the v squared my Newtonian potential. And this is, this is there in QED as well. There is retardation in QED, and you're going to have corrections as well. Now, there will be more diagrams. One will be this one, which is the nonlinearities. Oh, by the way, about the method of reasons I was saying, if you screw out, because you span here, you screw up your IR and also your UV. So you, you have to be careful that when you regularize the theory, and you might run into divergences because you're iterating Green's functions, that you're very careful about how to remove the IR and the UV. Okay? So all this leads to all these uh, uh, subtleties also with the tails because we are expanding an integral. And we're saying, okay, this contributes to the real part, this contributes to the imaginary part. But we were ignoring up until recently that the tail could also contribute to the real part. And when you include that, you introduce divergences because the tails actually are long-lived. And you have to make sure they understood that that divergence is just due to the splitting and that they should cancel. So there's a lot of subtleties with the field theory and so on. But ultimately, we're not doing anything fancy. We're just expanding these propagators. And this one is easy to calculate, and it gives you a gm1 m2 over r squared correction to the Newtonian potential. And you just need the trigraviton vertex here, and it's very easy to, to actually know how, how does it look like. This is k1, k2, and k3. It has to be symmetric. There is no direction to point into, so we have to come with some sum. The only thing you need to know is which number you get here. And you just get 1 over a m plank. And then you put your propagators, which was 1 over k squared. And then you see each one, the propagator will kill one of the k squares. And you're going to end up with an, an integral of 1 over k squared, k squared. But one of them will be killed. So twice the 1 over k squared will give you 1 over r squared. So then you get the first correction due to nonlinearities to the Newtonian potential. Now you get another diagram. You see each one of these things like killed a line. Each one of them will be killed by the vertex. And then it shrinks the diagram. It's like you were computing a diagram like this. And then you have to be careful because you might end up with an integral like this. We know a e to the I k kx because you put it on the same line. And this is zero in DIMREC, in dimensional regularization, because it's scaleless. So as long as you're careful with that, then you can compute this uh, with no problem. So you are introducing divergences because you're iterating green functions in a point. So you integrate k to infinity. There is no cutoff anymore, but it doesn't matter. You just have to regularize it. And if you have a logarithmic divergences, what does that mean? That you're going to dress up your Wilson coefficients and they might have some running. Which means that as you move in scales, there is logarithmic enhancement. And, and I don't have time. I have to stop again. You have logarithmic enhancement in many of these coefficients. For example, this quadrupole moment, due to this tail effect, due to the radiation, it generates a logarithmic correction, and that logarithmic enhances the power. And also it gives you a logarithmic correction on the binding energy, which is, is, is really like exactly like the beta logarithm in, in QED, which is really nice. So you just crank up the machine. Notice one more thing. No, OK, two things. How do we get the t, the t? So this was for the potential, which means I compute the vacuum amplitude, this wj, and I just match it as a potential. Because this dresses my m, which is my binding energy. Once I know the potential, I vary with respect to the sources, and I get the equation of motion. Now I go to the first, to the linear. This is h0. This is h1, power 1 of the radiation. Now I match for t. What does that mean? Do the same shit, but couple now to the radiation. And be careful to use the background gauge field. Otherwise, everything we did does not work. 
Now there is a trick here, which is the following. This is K. Son of a. This is um, let's call this Q. Let's call this K. K is much longer than Q. This is K plus Q. Because K is much longer than Q, we can multiple span this vertex and generate higher orders in K, which is like higher orders in the multiple expansion. That's the only trick. And when you do that, you can calculate the corrections to this IIJ. That will come, for example, from the nonlinearities here, from the velocity corrections here, and so on. And then you're going to have some I0, and then the 1 p.m. correction. Then you're going to have accelerations. They're going to have Newton plus 1 p.m. correction from all those guys that you're going to calculate. And then when you start putting dots, dot, 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 here you use the Newtonian acceleration, here you use the PN correction, and you can compute the flux up to, for example, with, with this type of corrections, up to 1 p.m. or next to Leonov. And what's going to happen is that you're going to get this 32 over phi nu x to the phi, which is the leading order that we saw before, plus something that now is going to have the mass ratio. It's going to have an A times the mass ratio plus number, times x, v square. And then you keep going. Potential, we have x corrections. Flux, we have x corrections. From here, we're going to get that evolution for x or, or evolution for the frequency. And from here, we compute the phase, the phase, gravitation, the frequency, and from here, the phase. So now just crank. Now, one other thing, I, I, I stop here. That, that, um, so this is modern, but not as modern. Um, modern in the sense that we basically match everything you need to know in gravitational waves to some in Feynman diagrams. This type of Feynman diagrams to get the T's, all the group theory to get the which moments of T I need to get into the quadrupoles. I have the expression for the flux. At zero order, I can match the potential. Right? So use the same way you did before. There's one, one interesting thing is the following. The only left of, if you're computing the potential, which means all the diagrams that you can have with many sources, so there are three level diagrams, right? Cut by the sources, truncated by the sources. There's a leftover integral to do, which is this one, if you want. All this will give you one final integral, which is the Fourier transform. That will make it a potential. So there's only, if you want, there is no flow of momentum because all these are sources, but there's one final P. So you can actually match, for example, this diagram. It kind of looks like a one-loop diagram because the iteration of the Green's function will be left over here. So we can match it into something that has that, that extra P integral and a one-loop self-energy, where you go P plus K, uh, uh, K uh, Q, P plus Q, and P. And then here there's an integral of 1 over P square, uh, Q square, 1 over p plus q squared in three dimensions, d3q, this one loop, that resembles the type of iterated Green function that we have here. So we can map all those into self-energies. So we can have diagrams like this and whatever. We are now at four loops and some parts of five loops, matching this type of diagrams into self-energies in three-dimensional self-energies in field theory, massless, that can be done up to uh, five loops. And that's why, how we get here, for example, the four post-Newtonian potential. For the radiation, you have to do the same, but attach gravitons outside, multiple expand, and then read off who that guy is, or moments of that guy, which are the ones that enter there. And to get moments of this guy, remember, we can just multiple expand in K, because the coefficients in K already have the moments. So once I read off the one-point function, I multiply in k, multiple expanding k, and I just read off the moment. And that's what enters then in the flux. So we can also do this to very high order. Okay? You put that together, you predict the waveforms. You compute up to five post-Newtonian order, and then include a new coupling, a new source coupling, which is quadratic, which is the love number, which depends twice in the, in the, in the field. So there will be a correction due to the love number that will also enter. So then the point is, like, where is this value? If I know the waveforms really, really well, because I know the GR part, and I include the correction from the tidal love number. If I know the waveforms very well, can I really prove whether this is zero or not? And if it's not zero, what is it? 
And this could be boson stars, cloud of axions around black holes, new objects. This is how we're going to get to, to probe new physics through gravitational waves, high precision, the same way we do at the LHC, say with electroweak Carl Lagrangian, with an effective theory that probes that new physics on short scales. But you need to get to the level of accuracy. That's what effective theories are about, such that you're sensitive to that order, the order which this operator enters, which is 5 p.m. OK? I had to stop. Otherwise, I will tell you how we are now modernizing even the Feynman diagrams with the amplitude methods. But maybe I can come once again next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, any last question? This is your last chance. Is yes, I have to leave. Um, um, shoot me an email if you're still interested, OK? Um, right here. If you have any questions uh, or you want to learn more, um, I will try to organize a school where we will try to uh, get people. There's a, a, a lot of people in amplitude who are now interested in doing this type of calculation. So there's people in, 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 uh, in Denmark. There's people in Sweden. So we'll try to put together some kind of school where we'll focus on, on uh, amplitude meets gravity and uh, try to elaborate on all the things. So um, stay tuned. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.